Welcome, welcome. So glad that each and every one of you are here. Glad for those of you in the room and glad for those of you who are joining us online. I know we have a nice crowd online as well. My name is Sujin Pak. I'm Dean of the School of Theology, Boston University, um, and I'm so delighted to be here to welcome you to the Lowell Lecture for spring 2022. The Lowell Lectures are made possible by the visionary support and generosity of the Lowell Institute. And the School of Theology is just incredibly grateful for their, the ways that the Lowell Institute has partnered with us to support conversation, awareness, and learning through these kinds of lectures and conversation. The Lowell Lectures this year are dedicated to the themes of racial justice with attention to cross-advocacy and cross-racial solidarity. The school seeks to take a proactive stance against various forms of racism in our world today. And we seek to engage these topics through a lens of cross-advocacy and cross-racial solidarity. By doing so, we're trying to uphold what I might call a both-and rather than an either-or way of being in the world. And the hope is to invite conversations across differing identities, locations, and embodiments with the aim of honoring differences in a non-competitive spirit, and also recognizing intersectionality along the way as well. For I believe and we believe that each of us in our distinct identities and our distinct embodiments can be for each other, and that there is wisdom in identifying shared experiences as well as paying attention to and clarifying distinctiveness. Well, again, my thanks to the Lowell Institute for making this lecture possible. My thanks to Dr. Lee Butler for your presence with us and the words and wisdom that you'll share. My thanks to Dr. Hian Che for moderating, our um, director of the Shaw Center and professor of practical theology, as well as thanks to our distinguished panelists who will join us tonight. And Dr. Che will bring a welcome. Please join me in welcome. Thank you, Dean Park. Reverend Dr. Dean Butler actually uh, was my PhD advisor when I actually studied at CTS. So when I met him, I was, uh, I have to confess that right now, I was quite racist. I didn't know what to do with racism and I was raised and born and raised in Korea and so I didn't have a much concept of racism at all. But you know, maybe after you hear you would imagine that he wouldn't let me just be myself. No, you, I, you need the education about racism. So you don't have to be act like a racist. And he make me non-racist after all. So I'm very proud of him. And uh, I'm going to introduce um, his uh, bio. Very short one, but it's quite long <laughs> in reality. Okay, so uh, Reverend Dr. Dean Lee H. Butler, Jr is a vice president of academic affair and academic dean, and also the William Tarboni professor of the history of religions and Africana post, uh, pastoral theology at, is it, oh, okay, okay. So, um, uh, per, Africana pastoral theology at Phillips Theological Seminary in Oklahoma, Tarsa. Prior to joining Phillips, he was the Distinguished Service Professor of Theology and Psychology at the Chicago Theological Seminary for 24 years. In 2006, he was promoted to the rank of a full professor and became the first African American to achieve this rank at CTS. He is the founder of the Center for Study of Black Faith and Life at CTS. He is co-editor of Edward Wimbley Reader, a black Pastoral Theology, uh, Baylor University Press 2020, the author of Listen, My Son, Wisdom to Help African American Fathers, Abingdon Press 2010, Liberating Our Dignity, Saving Our Souls, Charlie's Press 2006, A Loving Home, Caring for African American Marriages and Family, Pilgrim Press 2000, and also a lot of numerous articles. He is the pastor president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion, a member of the American Academy of Religion, the Society for Pastoral Theology, and the Association of Black Psychologists. An ordained minister of the American Baptist Churches USA since 
1988, he is a preacher, scholar, teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He received his Bachelor of Art from the Bucknell University, Master of Divinity from Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Master of Theology from Princeton Theological Seminary, and Master in Philosophy and, and also Doctor of Philosophy from the Drew University. Here is Dean Butler. Thank you for that introduction. As Dr. Che began to talk about the beginning of our relationship, I have told her recently, even though she says she's proud of me, I am proud of her, and I always note to her that she has outpublished me. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> I'm very grateful to Dean Park for inviting me to be a part of a series of conversations with the goal of raising awareness of and naming racial injustices in this historic moment of higher education seeking to advance issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. I'm delighted to be a part of a dialogue here at Boston University School of Theology. Our conversations across the academy present us with the possibility of initiating a new story, a new story across the academy. So thank you, Dean Park, for allowing me to participate in your mission and vision here and for our collaboration of working to change the academy, to change hearts and minds. I want to thank uh, Andrew Kimball for all of his hard work in organizing my time here with you. I also want to acknowledge all of my colleagues here at, <clears throat> excuse me, Boston University School of Theology, those who I've known through the years that I have greeted. Uh, some of them are perhaps online. Uh, and rather than calling everyone's name, I'll just say hello to all. You know there's always that risk of leaving someone out. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to us having some conversation for being able to stimulate our thinking around this topic of stop listening with your eyes, transcending stereotypes wrapped in color consciousness. As I begin to reflect together, I want us to enter our conversation by thinking about our stereotypes. We've all been socialized by stereotypes. We see someone, size them up head to toe, and in seconds we determine what they are based upon an internal typing checklist to label an other in order to navigate the world in which we live safely. We see blonde hair, red hair, and we draw conclusions. We see tanned bodies, brown bodies, and we draw conclusions. We see yellow bodies. Take a moment. We see yellow bodies. Now, what was the image that came to mind? Was it an Asian yellow? Or was it an African American yellow, often identified as high yellow or red bone? You see, even a partial description will evoke images to draw our conclusions based upon stereotypes we've each been given for our whole lives. In an age marked by stereotypes, phobias, and hatred, I want to call our attention to two groups that have been terrorized by America and seen as enemies within America. 
African Americans and Korean, Korean Americans have been pitted against one another in ways that breed hatred and prevent our two communities from forming coalitions that transcend stereotypes. We tend to think of stereotypes as absurd characterizations. There are stereotypes like blacks are unintelligent and lazy while Asians are good at math and industrious. Looking carefully at these stereotypes, they not only declare social location, they simultaneously create tensions and animosities between the two groups. <clears throat> While both groups might be identified as minority, one group gets identified as the model minority with privileges and advantages. <clears throat> the unintelligent versus the good at math the lazy versus the industrious. Stereotypes can be seen as creating and sustaining a system of control by attributing character to color. When Europeans came to Turtle Island, also known today as America, the indigenous inhabitants were seen as savages. Once Europeans began to import captive Africans who were also seen as savages, the Native Americans then were identified as noble savages. Consider the historic stereotypes of the black brute or black beast and the yellow peril in all his glory. These two stereotypes were not simply about overlaying the character of African and Asian men. They were created to reinforce white male supremacy through advocating the defense of enshrined white women envisioned as being in mortal danger. These stereotypes are about self-defense extending this interpretation as a flow of consciousness. The ideologies of anti-blackness and anti-Asian hate are stereotypes moving through American society to counter agendas of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. <clears throat> Listen to this story and description of what I'm pointing to. Many years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, many years ago, my close colleague, K. Samuel Lee, a Korean American pastoral theologian, and I were invited with Elizabeth Johnson Walker to be panelists at a professional conference to talk about using womanist pastoral theology as a resource for pastoral counseling. While the three of us on the panel were the only persons of color in the room, it made for an interesting dynamic. I presented my theory of African-American cultural identity formation and the ways its development was influenced by womanist theology and womanist ethics. Dr. Lee, Sam, presented the ways his identity as a clinical psychologist was informed by his doctoral advisor, who was an African-American woman. Now, I had heard Sam present at professional conferences, but this time he was different. He presented from his pastor's identity. And to my surprise, his cadence and resonance sounded like that of a traditional black preacher. We talked about that later. <clears throat> I had heard other Korean pastors preach in a similar fashion, so 
The surprise was not the similarity between Korean and African-American preaching. The surprise was hearing Sam sound that way. Now, although my theory had been published for several years, no one in the room had read my book. Yet, this room filled with white cl clinical practitioners proceeded to deconstruct my approach in order to fit it into their paradigms of understanding. My attempts to clarify and correct their misinterpretations were met with disregard. During the exchange, I was asked, well, why aren't you more like Ed Wimberly or Archie Smith? This, of course, was their way of saying I was not acceptable to them. Another, looking at me, stated, you're angry. And pointing at Sam, said, and he has a gentle Eastern approach. I thought, did you listen to his presentation? <laughs> the attitude of the session was clear. The room was listening with their eyes. Eyes that were filled with stereotypes. They were looking at me through the stereotypes of black and looking at Sam through the stereotypes of Asian. I was the aggressive, angry black man. And Sam was the soft and gentle Asian. Stereotypes, because if you know Asians, you know they're not always soft and gentle. <laughs> we were both completely misinterpreted and denied the integrity of our stories. For their collective comfort, Sam and I were forced into stereotypical boxes to preserve the categories of their clinical practices. Instead of transcending their stereotypes in order to learn how to be more culturally aware, they pacified themselves with their social stereotypes. I was black and angry, so they did not have to listen to me. Sam was yellow and gentle, so they did not have to be challenged by him. Furthermore, by focusing on their color consciousness, they were able to deflect from engaging womanist thought, which was the main topic of discussion. Their theoretical figures remained sacred and without spot or blemish. In the end, they had successfully insulated themselves from diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. What happened in that room of pastoral counselors was antithetical to the work of pastoral counseling. Instead of seeking community and communion, they sought to validate their own image. George Kelsey defined racism as an idolatrous faith where whiteness replaces the divine image. Their or that conference session was also filled with idolatry as it stereotyped the panelists as an act of their faith. Society is often organized and maintained by creating brokenness and separating groups of people by provoking hate. Consider these wise words. <clears throat> we love God because God first loved us. Those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God 
must love their brothers and sisters also. So to reframe that last verse, the commandment we have from the Holy One is this. Those who love the Holy One must love others also. The words of John declare that believers cannot separate their spiritual life from their human existence in the world. Jesus declared that we are to love God with all our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. We therefore cannot say with integrity, I love God, but I hate you. That statement is an example of what it means to live a fractured and fragmented life. Howard Thurman, theologian, mystic, and luminary of Boston University, reflected on the power of hate in his commencement address delivered in 1943 at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. At a moment in history when the world was convulsing with violence and raging in world war, Thurman said hate is often used to dehumanize and thereby become the cloak of moral justification for doing the deeds which under normal circumstances would leave the individual or nation covered with shame and inner spiritual confusion. It's not very different from what County Cullen said about lynching where he declared lynching in America is God's glory and my country's shame. Taking the inward journey, this inward journey of faith and seeking understanding, Thurman sought to describe the violence of war that was framed by hate. As a force of dehumanization, hate creates an us against them, a way of defining the world, declaring difference as the mode for declaring one's identity energizes expressions of hatred by creating impassable barriers for relationship. <clears throat> Physical differences are exaggerated to make one person human and another person less than human. Color prejudice is an easy target for describing difference and justifying hatred. Hate is a feeling that establishes a position of self-defense. Saying I hate you, therefore, becomes a statement of self-preservation and self-righteousness. In his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, Thurman reflects on the meaning of hate and color prejudice. He says, hate cannot be defined, but it can be described. Hatred, he explained, often begins in a situation in which there is contact without fellowship. Contact that is devoid of any of the primary overtures of warmth and fellow feeling and genuineness. His reflections, although articulated based upon his observations of World War II and America's dehumanizing comments about the Japanese were grounded by the intergenerational trauma of racism. To that he said, I know from the inside the meaning of that. The construct of race, which primarily denotes color, and the actions of racism which is aggression and self-defense masquerading as self-love are fueled by stereotypes of color consciousness. Stereotypes 
wrapped in color consciousness have a way of producing magical thinking about hatred and bodily danger. Magic is the power to manipulate and control nature, and sometimes human nature. Rather than being vulnerable to the destructive influences of natural forces, magic manipulates supernatural forces to determine one's own destiny. Yet, <clears throat> even magic has not been free of color stereotypes as it's been described as black magic and white magic. As a result, there's a magic that is thought to protect the body and a magic that is thought to destroy the body. When race relations are infused with magical thinking, people can be made to just disappear without conscience or the feeling of moral consequences. Consider the hunters who pursued Ahmaud Aubrey and what they thought was the consequence of their behavior. Reflecting on race magic, Charles Long asked, how is it possible for people to see and know each other intimately and then act as if they're not a part of their lives? How could people act as if someone doesn't exist when they are touching them? He says, my problem with race starts with the erotic epistemology of the sensual. How can someone be present and then actions are taken on the basis of their being present, but at some point, although neither removes themselves, the other disappears. This magic changes the nature of an other by the thingification of their humanity, causing them to vanish into thin air. <clears throat> it was this magical thinking of an erotic epistemology that empowered, that empowered the Atlanta shooter to justify his hate crime based upon a socially constructed stereotype, believing that Korean women were fueling his sex addiction he went on a rampage to make them disappear in an effort to tame his own moral failings. Audre Lorde. African-American woman poet and social justice advocate, <clears throat> activist, is often quoted for her insightful critique of white feminism in the 1970s. Using slavery as her illustration, she stated, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. African-American scholars have understood this to mean that we cannot be liberated by using thoughts and theories designed to oppress us an ideological house whose foundation is built upon dehumanizing stereotypes directed by white supremacy will always lead racial ethnics to love whiteness and to hate themselves. In her book, The History of White People, Nail Painter writes, race is an idea, not a fact. And American history offers up a large bounty of commentary on what it means to be non-white, moving easily alterations in the meaning of race as color. She says the young nation in the common parlance was a white man's country, a polity and qualification for citizenship 
defined by race and limited to white men. A newspaper article published in Denver, Colorado, 1878 read, George John, a washy man from the Flowery Kingdom, was made a white male citizen by the district court, notwithstanding the decision of D Judge Sawyer of San Francisco that a Chinaman could not be made a citizen of the United States. Racial color prejudice. In the era portrayed Chinese as the yellow terror, the yellow danger, and the yellow peril to provoke whites to fear Chinese immigration. As the fear of Chinese presence grew, so did the violence against Chinese. In 1882, Korea entered into a trade agreement with the United States, which opened the doors of immigration. Although Korean immigration into Hawaii is identified as 1903, there was likely an unacknowledged Korean presence in California, perhaps due to Koreans being inappropriately identified as Chinese. <clears throat> According to Edward Chang, the first Korean church in Los Angeles was established in 1904. <clears throat> I know some of you are trying to clear my throat. <clears throat> <clears throat> As decades of immigration legislation and war, post-war recovery activities Koreans began to immigrate to the United States without a full awareness of the nature of color prejudice and the violence that it inspired. They didn't know the hatred Africans in America experience was not very different from the hatred Koreans experienced under Japanese rule. Koreans entered the U.S. with hopes of a new life without understanding the traumatic consequences of their seeking to live the American dream. My first significant relationships with Koreans came during my doctoral studies at Drew University. My classmate, Kim Jin Young, and I became good friends brought together through the struggle to pass French exams. Although we were both in the psychology and religion program, it was not psychological theory that united us. We were united against the common enemy of the graduate school that was inflicting great pain and suffering on our lives. In those days, we never talked much about what it meant to be African American or Korean in America. Instead, our friendship was grounded in the common experience of study and resisting what we both thought was an unjust system of examination. My second significant relationship came through my studies with the late Dr. Lee Jung Young. With him, I was given my first descriptions on what it was like to be Korean in America. My private conversations with him occurred during the time when he was writing his book, Marginality, The Key to Multicultural Theology. Drew University is located within a white suburban community in northern New Jersey. On one occasion, Dr. Lee shared with me, and I'm quoting him, people say that Madison is a very nice community, but not for me, he said. It's not very comfortable for me as a Korean. I'm not welcome. He expressed that although he was a professor at the university, he did not have the same high status 
as a white resident. Even a white person who may not have a college degree held a higher status than he did in Madison, so he communicated. In his experience, he was not recognized as a citizen because Madison citizens were thought to be white. In 1992, I was still a student at Drew while the city of Los Angeles exploded in civil unrest and street violence, violence between African Americans and Korean Americans. The civil unrest that lasted three days with South Central LA and Koreatown suffered the most significant losses. It was not clear to me how I should interpret the violence in light of my relationships with my friend, Jin Young, and my professor, Dr. Lee. And sadly, we never talked about it, even though the tensions between our two communities had boiled over into complicated violence. Part of our silence may have been due to the distance between Madison, New Jersey and Los Angeles, California. Another part of our silence may have been due to the coping mechanisms racial ethnics in America employ in order to survive in this system. There's a reason why generations of Tulsans did not talk about the massacre and the destruction of the Greenwood District. Keep silent if you want to live. My first theological teaching position was at Lancaster Theological Seminary. There, my Asian students were from Japan. Because my education had taught me to be culturally sensitive, I sought to be respectful of Japanese culture as I taught my students. I was familiar with Koyama's water buffalo theology, which was not presented as a Japanese theology, rather it was presented as an Asian theology. This had an unfortunate impact on having me lump all Asians into the same experiential basket. However, all that changed when I arrived at Chicago Theological Seminary in 1996. Preparing to teach a PhD seminar with my senior colleague, the late Dr. Robert Moore, <clears throat> I knew about half the class would be filled with Korean students. M to my mind, Koreans are Asian. So I selected a text the Anatomy of Dependence, written by Doi, a Japanese psychiatrist. Yeah, you laugh. <laughs> Conversations with my friend and my professor at Drew did not talk about Korean history. And my theological education basically said all Asians are alike not very different from talking about something happening in Africa and never really pointing out the country, you know what I mean? But as I began to engage my Korean doctoral students on Dewey's thought, I observed their lack of enthusiasm and a subtle rejection that was clearly observable from my students. Curious about their disinterest, I asked why. Being very respectful of their African-American professor, the Korean students began to speak in very gentle and polite ways. And they spoke about their history of Japanese occupation of Korea, a history of which I had absolutely no knowledge. It was then that I was introduced to the indignities Koreans experienced at Japanese hands. That was my first moment 
of ever hearing about comfort women who were, at the time they were taken, many of them girls. The more they spoke to me and to one another, their deep feelings became clear, which I, as an African-American, observed to be more than simply sorrow. In fact, what I observed was something closer to rage. And as a black man, rage was something I had intimate relationship with. The lesson was an awakening as my students like Ko Young Soon became my teachers. I learned that in order to begin to understand Koreans and Korean Americans, one must grasp the concepts of Han and Hwabdong, which distinguish Koreans from other Asian groups. A non-Korean can only begin to understand the deep meaning of Han by first acknowledging the power that feelings of resentment, bitterness, grievance, or regret hold in a person's life. Older Koreans and Korean Americans, most often women, express they live life full of Han and developed Hwabong, a disease of frustration and rage following misfortune. I believe that Korean, Han, and Wabwang resonate with African-American soul and blues. As noted by Thurman, contact without fellowship breeds hate. Desiring to have good relationships with my Korean students and to not breed hate in the following years, or the years that followed that classroom experience, I regularly placed myself in the company of my Korean colleagues to learn more about Korean culture and history. <clears throat> my commitment resulted in my first PhD student <laughs> being a Korean woman who graduated in 2003, the Reverend Dr. Che Hyun, and you see what she looked back like back then. <laughs> in June 2003, the Society for Pastoral Theology held an annual conference, or its annual conference, in Koreatown, Los Angeles. The focus of the conference was intended to encourage pastoral theologians to be more culturally sensitive in their psycho-spiritual work. On that first evening of the conference, we enjoyed a Korean buffet dinner. After several years of eating Korean food and sushi with my students, I, unlike many of my white colleagues, was very familiar with the popular items that were on the menu. Some began to complain that the kimchi was very hot. <laughs> Having eaten kimchi that ranged from water to truly hot, I laughed and informed them that what we were eating was mild to the Korean palate. <laughs> the evening's entertainment included Korean drummers. There was a moment while listening to the drummers that I closed my eyes and by listening with my ears and following the rhythms that I experienced within my soul, I heard beats similar to those that I experienced in Ghana. It was at that moment that I truly recognized that Korea and some African cultures are not very far apart. So you have a Korean drum and the 
African talking drum. In February 2005, the Association of Theological Schools hosted its first consultation of Asian and Asian North American scholars in Redondo Beach, California, organized by the Committee on Race and Ethnicity on the impact of Asian and Asian North Americans on theological education, contributions, challenges, and prospects. My Korean American colleague, Sing A. Yang, invited me to the conference and introduced me at the opening session as an honorary Korean. At that meeting, I had my first Korean American experience of dinner at one restaurant, driving for dessert at a tea house, followed by singing at a karaoke bar and drinking some of Korea's favorite beverages late into the night. <laughs> my new Korean colleagues were surprised by how comfortable I was throughout the evening, but this was only because I opened myself to the experience and allowed myself to be integrated into fellowship that evening. In 2009, I partnered with Sam Lee to develop a conference to precede the annual meeting of the Society for Pastoral Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. <clears throat> we gathered African and African American, Korean and Korean American to have discussions to bring unity to our two communities. No whites were allowed at that meeting. This moment of coalition building was marked by honest discussion between African American and Korean pastoral theologians to share the stereotypes we have been taught about one another and to develop new relationships grounded in trust for one another. In March 2018, I was keynote speaker at an annual conference of the Korean Association for Pastoral Counseling in Seoul, Korea. Soon after accepting that invitation, I received other invitations from Chicago Seminary alums, and they taught on faculties across Seoul. And so I was invited to lecture at four different universities along with the conference. Because I regularly socialize with Korean colleagues, mentees, and students, I was well acquainted with Korean cuisine. However, I did have one small concern related to dining in Korea. While I was quite adept at using Chinese chopsticks, Korean chopsticks, even thinner than Japanese chopsticks are made of metal, which I had never used before. Dining with different groups of people each day, my hosts were regularly surprised and delighted by my ability to use metal chopsticks. <laughs> On more than one occasion, my host also translated the compliments of restaurant staff as they observed me enjoying my meals while using metal chopsticks. The delightful response of my host regularly or during these, these dining experiences taught me an important lesson about hospitality. Most theological reflections on hospitality have been focused on the host's attitudes and actions. The emphasis has tended to be upon welcoming and caring for the needs of the guest, the one who is the stranger, also known as an alien. The dynamics of hospitality, however, do not flow in one direction. Hospitality is dialogical. As the person being hosted, 
I was keenly aware of my responsibility of being an appreciative guest. That did not simply mean saying thank you regularly and often. It meant following the flow of activities while making no demands, reflecting gratitude by eating traditional foods, being open to learning so that strangers might become friends. Negative public rhetoric transformed all Asians into the virus here in the US. Fear, anxiety, and anti-Asian hate named COVID-19 Asian flu and Kung flu, an airborne virus that cannot be seen suddenly became visible across America through the eyes of anti-Asian racism. Media headlines like, there were 3,800 anti-Asian racist incidents, mostly against women in the past year, began to be reported across news outlets. And if there's no doubt in my mind that these reports of attacks were fueled by stereotypes regarding Asian women. Another headline, Asian Americans reported biggest increase in serious incidents of online hate and harassment during COVID-19 pandemic. In this era of protesting crime against humanity and embracing the sanctity of human life. We must form coalitions to stand with colleagues and friends as family. The escalation of Asian violence has been quite concerning, particularly the violence that has been attributed to African Americans. Social media scenes began to shape an interpretation that the escalating violence was African Americans against Asian Americans. The video of an 84 year old Thai American man assaulted in San Francisco by an African American male teenager went viral in late January 2021. There were, res or this view resulted in some AAPIs and African Americans forming coalitions to stop the hate. I was invited by Kirsten O, oh, a Korean American pastoral theology colleague and friend to participate in a dialogue hosted by the Asian American Pacific Islander Av Advisory Council, <clears throat> a group of theological educators and pastors from across the United States. They were committed to countering anti-Asian hate and the scapegoating associated with COVID-19. In conclusion to these thoughts and stories, I'm committed to a deeper analysis of our history of conflict and a fuller retelling of our mutual histories of pain. If we allow the forces that breed hate to continue to mediate contact without fellowship, we will continue to be at war with one another, never truly understanding that our separation only benefits those who profiteer from, from hate and fear. If we continue to allow our contact to be influenced by xenophobia, homophobia, gynophobia, melanophobia, and sociophobia. That is, if we continue to fear physical and cultural difference, fear sexual and sensual difference, fear women's power, fear black skin, fear social relationships, then we will be the perpetrators of hate. 
Scripture declares that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of sound mind. I'm committed to transcending the inclination to listen with my eyes. I'm committed to transcending the stereotypes wrapped in national color consciousness. My hand is extended in fellowship and partnership to unite against hate at this moment when it matters most. Thank you very much. I, I never met somebody um, when I was when I arrived in the USA I already told you that I have no concept of racism whatsoever but as uh, I learned what the laces or the racism is I got really like this fear that I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. It's like uh, there is no text. I just have to learn by the experience. And it was very scary. And I never ask any African American actually uh, people to learn Korean because I felt obligated to learn African-American people's history first. So I was always like a, so super careful. How can I understand them? What should I do? But never expect that African-American people try to understand Koreans ever. But now you can see. <laughs> My professor knew about me as I learn and try to learn the racism. And he did not punish me not to know the racism, but rather, oh, I want to also know your culture. So it has to be mutual. It's never like a one way. And just say, you have to know, you are in US, so you have to know this. Nothing like that. It was always like a gentle, but very radical, subversive <laughs> approach <laughs> for me to go on and move on until I reached the edge of that uh, learning. So I deeply thank you and also very proud of you and also deeply grateful that you learn Koreans and learning the metal chapstick, using metal chapstick, oh my gosh, that is really hard. <laughs> you, all of you should try. <laughs> it's good for your actually brain, the scientist said. So, Thank you for your great talk today, and thank you for listening to my also extra walk here. But I know you're tired of sitting on the dead, very hard, thick chair. So why don't you all actually just, uh, yeah, stand up a little bit and move your body so you can actually have a little bit better, maybe, attention for next 20 or more minutes for the respondents. Yeah. So, okay. So first, I will teach you how to you <laughs> move your body. Okay, do this. And imagine that there is the wall. And so like push harder and harder and harder and then make some circles. And also this. Okay, slowly and yeah. And then also make your body like this. Then go up and up and up. Okay, the left. Oh, yeah, it's hard, right? And then <laughs> coming back slowly and then right. Okay. Okay, coming back. And then go further. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay. So, and also move your hips and also your maybe body like this a little bit. So you, you can, yes, 
make the circle. Then also doing like this and move your body. Yes. Okay. Sit better now? Okay, sit down. <laughs> Okay, we are going to have uh, three dif different respondent, uh, respondent today, um, all the panelists. So I'm going to introduce the three panelists at once and then maybe they can all come out here and speak. Okay, so our first one is Ms. Connie Bon. She is, yes, she, <laughs> she is our PhD student and currently a third year doctoral student in Boston University School of Theology studying Christian social ethics. She draws upon psychology, post-structuralism, uh, post and theology from the below to form responses to issues of violence and healing. She approaches the approaches theological pedagogy and research as integral to the driving of individuals, communities, and the public sphere. Currently, she is focusing on questions regarding receptive moral injury, internalized racism, theology and attachment, and the spirit hauntings. And also our second uh, panelist, Mr. Mako Nagasawa. And Mr. Mako is the founder and executive director of the Anastas, uh, Ana, Anastasis Center for Christian Education and Ministry, whose mission it is to proclaim the healing of humanity in Jesus and the restorative justice of God. Mr. Marco grew up in uh, Siratos, California, and went north to uh, Stanford, where he studied the industrial engineering and public policy with a focus on education. He worked at Intel Corporation for six years while serving a Spanish-speaking ministry to Mexican immigrants in Easter Palo Alto, California. He married Ming in May 1990 and moved to Boston. He then worked for two startup companies trying to bring technology and jobs to inner city communities. Since 2000, Mr. Marco, Ming, and their two children, John and Joy, have lived with friends in a Christian international community house in a black and brown neighbors in Dorchester. He did a campus ministry from, 19, uh, two, from 2001 to 2014 and founded the Anastasis Center in 2014. They worship at Neighborhood Church of Dorchester, where Mr. Marco serves on the elder team and focuses on debt reduction and multiplying home ownership for black and brown house household. He on a Master of Theological Studies from the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Seminary in May 2019. His latest book is titled Abortion Policy and Christian Social Ethics in the United States published by VPN Stock Publisher in 2021. In addition to Christian ethics, theology, uh, biblical studies, and early church history, he enjoys food, tea, and stories from around the world. He misses the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and also last, the Reverend Dr. J. Williams. <laughs> Hailing from Buffalo, New York, um, Dr. J despises the snow and dreams of the life in Wakanda. <laughs> to wit, he is pretty much obsessed with the Black Panther, as well as the 1980s cartoon series, The uh, Thundercats. And Reverend Dr. J. Williams returned to the union as lead pastor on July 1st, 2018, having guided this congregation September 2012 to June 2017, an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, Pastor, Joy, uh, Pastor J has served the congregations in New York City, Boston, and San Francisco. Now, Dr. Williams holds a Master of uh, uh, Divinity with the highest honor from the Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, 2009, and a Bachelor of Art, magna cum laude, from Harvard College, 2003. In May 2017, Dr. J received the 
PhD in the study of religion from the Harvard University Graduate School of Art and Sciences. Dr. Williams' work explores the meaning of a spirit in black cultural discourse at the intersection of race, class, gender, and sexuality, particularly how spirit talk has been a marginalizing language of power. We are lucky to have him as an adjunct instructor at School of Theology. And Dr. Uh, also J, a queer cisgender man, lives in a Boston Roxbury neighborhood with his two energetic dog, Bentley and Hurston. Thank you. So three, yeah, please, uh, panelists, please come. Thank you, Dean Park and the Lowell Lecture for inviting me to respond to this wonderful lecture. And thank you, Dean Butler, for your reflections on what a new story of black and Korean American relations might look like. I appreciate your theological and pastoral insight on the ways our communities can both carry both very different yet relatable experiences of racialized oppression in the United States. And in particular, the harmful impact of stereotyping the othering gaze has on us as persons, as well as our relationships with each other. Throughout your reflection, particularly your stories you told, I cannot help but be reminded of Emily Townes' womanist ethic, that when we, re when we reflect deeply into our particular particularities as sources of knowledge, that is, all the histories, narratives, peoples, and contexts that create the threads of who I am, it is in those depths where I find places where my threads, as Towns puts it, meets and greets others, for we are intricately and intimately interwoven. Mm -hmm. Howard Thurman also says something similar, that in, that in deeply knowing ourselves, in that depth is where we find the deep hunger for life and the, and the deep hunger for right relationships that he believes ex exists in all people. The deep desire for contact with fellowship also reminds me of something from Korean theology called chung, which is, that, which is an attachment and a love of warmth. That deep desire for contact with fellowship. And I hear Thurman's great hunger in, in the compassionate relationships that you are sort of modeling in your reflection. I'm very honored to have received it and to also respond to it. As you noted in your address, a news story is urgent. You noted how the pandemic has spotlighted both, both anti-black and anti-Asian hate in the United States. Tomorrow is the anniversary of March 16th, the Atlanta spa shootings, which highlighted the rising tide of anti-Asian sentiment during the pandemic and also uncovered the already anti-Asian sentiment that had been going on and that our community had always been aware of as well as also uncovering anti-Asian sentiment that was in post 9-11 against Sikhs, against Southeast Asian Muslims and so forth. One really difficult issue to confront is the hate and the narrative of hate between black and Asian American Pacific Islander, Islanders, AAPI communities. It was really tragic, again, to hear you recount the videos of the black man attacking that Asian elder, and the and the Asian sort Asian anti-Asian sentiments within the black community, but it also reminded me of the tragic dynamics that constitute AAPI communities, the animosity towards blacks, black persons, and bodies and communities, which is layered with colorism, poverty, American militarism in Asia, colonialism and complex immigrant stories around American dream and white savior, which you have relayed to us. And what really, really struck me in your address was how stereotypes not only condition slash limit our personhood and the expression of our personhood and how our personhood is received and how we experience ourselves. It also conditions, limits, and frames the relations themselves in stereotype tropes. If we interrogate and deconstruct why the narrative is black Asian animosity and read between the lines of its internalization and violent enactments in history, what I find is that this narrative is not so essential. 
and that an alternative history of black Asian cooperation, solidarity, and civility has and does exist and perhaps needs retrieval. For one, while there are many factors, one that I would like to highlight is how in the 1960s at the height of the black power movement and the workers movement, which garnered diverse sol solidarity, it, which included Asian activists such as Yuri Kochiyama and Grace Lee Bogues, the United States at that particular time in the 1960s and 70s pursued and actively sought highly educated professionals from Asian countries in the immigration process. Media then touted these professional immigrants as success stories of American meritocracy and colorblindness. If they can make it, why can't you? Um, that's how model minority has been weaponized. Consequently, what happens is the dismiss, dismissal of racism, blaming other marginalized communities for their poverty and crime, and creating resentment and rage against each other. And this rage has exploded in the past, most notably in the 1976 killing of black teenager Latasha Harlins by a Korean American shopkeeper, which impacted the response of the LA riots. People ask, why is it that Koreatown was attacked when Rod, Rodney King was killed by white police officers. It was sort of, it was sort of a residue of rage and resent, like anger that happened from the killing of a young black teenage girl. And it would seem that some of these recent sightings of black on Asian violence is reminiscent of such kinds of factors. Yet at the same time, research has shown that there is much often, mu often much more solidarity or at least at the very least, civility between black and API persons in the everyday. Jenny Lee's book, Civility in the City, Black Jews and Koreans in Urban America, examines the everyday life of black, Jewish, and Korean small business owners in New York and Philadelphia, and shows that the norm is actually routine, civility, and active community integration. There's often stories of how Small business owners know their community, know them by name, know what their favorite products are. This is often what is routine, but that doesn't get shown. Mm. Additionally, a recent study by Samuel L. Perry titled Prejudice and Pandemic in the Promised Land, How White Christian Nationalism <laughs> Shapes American Racist and Xenophobic Views of COVID-19, finds that the strongest factor for Asian, Asian anti-Asian hate is actually a person or communities who buy into white Christian nationalism not necessarily a narrative of anti-black or anti-Asians or black against anti-Asians, yet that's how a lot of the narrative right now is shaping. So in that current, in this current situation is, are my questions, and I have a few, and some of them are also my desires and hopes as we try to create a new story together. My first question is, how do we make sense of this, that there's so much focused, again, on the narrative of anti or of black and Asian animosity. So that's sort of my first question. Is this history repeating itself? What's going on? Um, so that's my first question. And my second question for Dean Butler is, I also know you've done a lot of work in liberating persons from internalized racism. And I wanted to ask, what are those steps look like for you? Like, especially when we find it in ourselves and when we find it in our own communities or even when we find it against us. Um, I believe those are important questions to ask for the next stage or chapter. So thank you. Thanks, Connie. Um, all right, is this on? Okay. Uh, also, thank you very much, Dr. Butler. I, I'm gonna... Uh, basically ask two pastoral questions, which I, I hope we can discuss and we can all discuss, um, that, that uh, came, came to my mind and heart as I uh, listened to your comments and uh, your presentation, um, and, and also because uh, uh, I currently serve in a church that is in a mostly black mm -hmm. neighborhood. Uh, and 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 so, uh, and I've, I I did campus ministry uh, for 14 years. Many of those years were spent with a Korean American fellowship, and I've 
had the great privilege. So I've had the great privilege of being a, a guest and um, a, a mentor and um, a student, you know, to, to both these communities as well, uh, and, and have really appreciated um, being able to identify how being Japanese American and, and being a, a Japanese American male uh, intersects with that, both in terms of race relations and economic relations in the U.S., but also because of the Japanese-Korean history in Asia. And so the, um, so I, you know, I, I will pose these questions out of, out of a desire to learn more and, um, and hopefully say something interesting. <laughs> but the, um, and that is so. One of the questions is, um, how, Dr. Butler, how do you see Han and Soul slash Blues informing one another and and intersecting with each other? And I'm specifically wondering about trauma care in the church. Um, from what, what I've seen in one case when um, George Floyd was murdered. Um, there, there were many cries on Zoom from uh, black folks in, in my church community. And it reminded me of, a, I think, a comment that um, perhaps it was W.E.D. Du Bois identifies as the, uh, the cries of uh, black people as they uh, cried out even on on the slave ships that the somehow that was memorialized in in you know lament uh, in in a church context and I, I felt very privileged to to um, be entrusted to hear that um, it, it strikes me as as someone who does care about mental health concerns and uh, does pastoral work that those kinds of expressions of lament are so important for suffering and oppressed people. Uh, and, and, and just any time, even if it's not necessarily oppression, but just personal difficulties that we're going through, to be able to articulate those things. And, and so it, it just, um, it, it hit a chord to hear, to hear you bring Han into close conversation with soul and blues, and, and perhaps, it, you know, for my, I'm, I'm not an expert in music, but but soul uh, strikes me as as uh, a, a a cry of sorts, and and even a subversion of uh, European classical music, mm -hmm. and 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 so it is both lament and and triumph, and resistance, kind of all together, and and so I wondered again, I'm not. Um, I'm not Korean, but the, the description of Han is, is close to things in Japanese and Chinese culture, my wife is Chinese American, that, that, um, that do resonate somewhat. And the, the, the sense of what, have we seen any dialogue happening between Korean American churches or Asian American churches and, and black churches about the role of our emotions, the role of lament, the role of uh, corporate cries. Um, and, and also, is there the possibility of something like a redeemed version of Han, kind of the silent suffering? And I say that because uh, it rem I, I think at different times I'm reminded that Jesus did, on the one hand, he welcomed his disciples into Gethsemane with him. He wanted them to be with him in his suffering. So he, he, want, he didn't want to suffer alone. And uh, that's been personally challenging for me because there's something about uh, suffering that would sometimes cause me to isolate myself. And uh, I, I recognize that as well in, in folks where there is a history of trauma and there's an expectation of trauma, including when I enter into a church community. I, I, uh, people expect to be hurt. And so there's, there, but there, and so the, the role of a redeemed 
Han of silent suffering is intriguing to me, be, not because we suffer against Jesus, but is there a possibility of suffering with Jesus and, and caring uh, other people as f and inviting people for as far as they can go and as far as we can bear them to, to be there with us, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just reminded Jesus ultimately goes to confront the powers of empire he, in his trial, he goes to the cross to confront the corruption of sin in his own humanity and to the grave to confront death. And he is with the Father alone in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and there is a sense that uh, I, I have had when I have spent time with older Korean-American followers of Jesus, um, in, including Connie's parents, who I have, I've had the privilege of meeting, that they have had a certain kind, that there is a kind of rest and stability because they have experienced that uh, silent suffering with Jesus. And I can glimpse it and I can ap appreciate it. And, and it is a way of um, perhaps just setting our expectations that other people at any given time can come close, um, but it's really Jesus alone that goes with us all the way. The, the second question, so, so that was my first question, believe it or not. Um, my, my second question is, in pastoral work, how do we prepare people from different ethnic and racial communities or different church traditions for encountering one another? And uh, one of the images that, that I would say I've found helpful, I, I'm happy to hear any thoughts about it, is the image of plantation capitalism. And the reason is because it describes one of the, a few different dynamics uh, in the, the plantation capitalism of the, the US South, for instance, there was an effort by the elite white people to divide the labor force. And so you have enslaved African-Americans on the one hand and very poor, um, nominally free white people, but poor working class white people on the other hand who had to, who made very little because they're competing with slave labor in, in that sense. And so there is an investment in dividing the labor force. And I, I think that can, that's one thing that is, um, that I think has some truth about how the U.S. has treated African Americans and also Asian Americans in the U.S., but also in the Pacific and in Asia, where the U.S. has used Asia uh, or and Pacific, the Pacific Islands as uh, military bases uh, at, in order to counter the threat of the Soviet Union, and 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 so we or you know, Asian Pacific Islanders become cheap labor, for example, on Hawaiian or Filipino plantations, like actual plantations, because they can get cheaper labor there. So there, there is a way in which the it, plantation capitalism, I think, uh, dis, uh, helps people, helps Asian Americans and African Americans encounter one another and appreciate their stories uh, one another's stories, even though it's been uh, different in some ways. Uh, my question is, are there other images or helpful narratives that help these different groups uh, prepare for that encounter? Thank you. So thanks for this opportunity, uh, Dean Pak, uh, Reverend Dr. Che, uh, uh, Connie, fellow panelists, and Marco, uh, Reverend Kimball, Dean Joyce, Development Office, and of course, uh, Reverend Dr. Dean uh, Butler. Uh, so much gratitude for uh, the provocations of the lecture. Um, I, I want to locate my remarks at the intersection of uh, three corridors, uh, three pathways. Uh, first, of course, uh, being Dr. Butler's lecture this evening. Uh, secondly, the liturgical wilderness of Lent, where Christians find ourselves this season. 
And then third, uh, the displacement uh, into a forced desert of nearly three million uh, due to Putin's war and the invasion of Ukraine this year. Uh, so right, if Dr. Butler's desire is to, and I quote, develop new relationships for all through a focused reflection on African Americans and Korean Americans, end quote, uh, then I'm wondering tonight, uh, what are the grounds, the true grounds for interracial, uh, interethnic, international solidarity? What are the true grounds, uh, the foundations for coalition uh, in this contact uh, that is more, uh, that this contact with fellowship, right? In particular, I'm wondering how uh, the interrogation of what Dr. Butler uh, describes as, quote, histories of racial and ethnic oppressions economic exploitation and political subjugations, end quote. I'm wondering how uh, the analysis of these intersecting histories and exploitations and politics might motivate ethical intervention. Like, what do we do with it? Uh, at a time when we teeter on another Cold War that has already turned hot from the Red Scare of, uh, of Russia and the Yellow Terror right, of Russia's tacit partner, China, uh, during an age when the cosmic battle uh, between nuclear weapon holding superpowers rage, during a period where the duel among the economic ideologies of so-called free market capitalism and market socialism and the mixed command market economy of Russia destabilized an already broken world and when the chosen path in this geopolitical calculus is a battery of coercive economic sanctions whose effective and ethical value are questionable at best. Mm. So right, Dr. Butler's talking about love, um, right, and using Thurman, uh, this, this dance or, or this, this counterbalancing of, of a love with hate. I'm wondering what does the love of freedom, the love of the people of Ukraine, uh, with all of our thoughts and prayers, uh, when does this love become decisive ethical action? I'm pondering what, if anything, can be discerned from this liturgical period when spirit drives Jesus into desert to be tested by the devil, the Satan, the adversary as the world confronts a common enemy and the reality that three million souls are forced from their homes into a wilderness not of their own making or choosing. Mm. So where is home? What does it look like? And what happens when color prejudice manifests itself on the borders of Ukraine and black refugees are placed at the bottom of the most precarious situation since 1945? Mm -hmm. Who takes them in? Uh, I'll admit that I'm rather conflicted this evening, uh, torn between the eschatological hope of a Christian preacher and a, a tinge of Afro-pessimism that realizes that this does not end well. Surely as we journey this Lenten road at these intersections, we know that this ends with crucifixion and I'm not so sure if resurrection is real anymore. So what do we do with this right, false narrativization that Dr. Butler talks about and the thingification and the commodification uh, that is invoked here and the very real pervasiveness of whiteness manifest in white supremacy, a dominance that goes all the way down. But maybe I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself in this narrative, in the journey. We've not yet reached Jerusalem and the hill of Golgotha just yet. Although our faces are turned there, as we lament, as we did this past Sunday's in the lectionary. Uh, though even though we're not at Jerusalem, our eyes are trained there. Mm -hmm. So I ask, then what type of transformation, metamorphosis, conversion happens in this wilderness that we find ourselves? The chosen one of Lent, the forced one of a war. And what does repentance look like? Or maybe this too is the wrong question uh, with all of the ableist trappings of our language. 
always focused on sight, although we are certainly not advocating for the nonsense of colorblindness. So Dr. Butler's instruction is the right one. Stop listening with our eyes and hear the sound. Listen to the music. Then we might be able to collectively belt out the black national anthem and together lift every voice and sing. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Such good poetry there. Or are the warnings of those same lyrics penned by James Weldon Johnson becoming true? Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Seems to me that this learned forgetfulness, learned forgetfulness of our shared common humanity, the quote, idolatrous faith where whiteness replaces divine spirit, end quote, that Dr. Butler vis-a-vis -vis George Kelsey speaks of, this learned forgetfulness, this intended amnesia, it causes a collective jaundice. This is the yellowing that is not Asian and is more than skin deep. It cuts to the bone and the fleshiness of our body, of Christ. The yellowing due to organ failure, acute hepatic necrosis, the black death of the liver, due to the overconsumption and the prolonged intoxication of the world's wine. Or maybe it's from the Russian Stolichnia, vodka, that we've now boycotted, although Stoli actually is now distilled in Latvia, and the Stoli company is headquartered in Luxembourg. We talk about narratives. But I digress. Whatever the case, the transcendence of stereotyping color consciousness seems to require us to take a closer look, a deeper listen. And if we, black, white, brown, and yellow, are all jaundiced from being so damn drunk with the world's wine, maybe, just maybe, we will have the liquid courage to really say what needs to be said. Thank you, Dr. Butler, for your provocative, provocating words. Thank you. Dean Butler, I think you have a lot of uh, maybe um, questions for this, so I believe you have some answers to share. I'm not going to attempt to answer all these questions. Um, but I do want to thank you each for taking the time to give my thoughts a close reading and a careful listening. <clears throat> to begin to speak some of what I heard you asking, to give some response, because I do want to have everyone else have an opportunity. Um, is history repeating itself? Well, although my primary formation as a scholar uh, is in the area of psychology and religion, uh, pastoral psychology, pastoral theology, um, I began to retool uh, by being mentored by the late Dr. Charles Long, who's a historian of religions. and. So I do look at history and give an analysis a la uh, Charles Long that says absolutely history is repeating itself. Uh, I'm deeply uh, engaged by the, the writings of Koheleth, the book of Ecclesiastes, who lets us know if we are not aware, history is constantly repeating itself. Uh, and we think something is brand new because we've simply forgotten 
what has already been. So history will always repeat unless we break those cycles. And so part of what I'm writing is to say, let's look at the history and let's bring a stop to the cycles of, of violence, the cycles of thought that have kept us running on this treadmill of destruction. So the only way we can begin to change the narrative is to know what has been and take the steps to do something new. And so in order to take those steps toward liberation, we, we have to even look at how liberation and freedom have been narrated. What is the real meaning of being free? And what have we been uh, taught to believe about freedom? Um, as I listened to Brother Jay, I was also reminded of these questions about freedom. Uh, at the point when, when uh, former President Barack Obama was elected, there were uh, conversations that were happening within United Church of Christ that were looking at racism and having these kind of dialogues. And I was a participant in one of those churches, and someone came up to me and said, well, now that Obama has been elected, we don't need black liberation theology anymore. I'm like, really? <laughs> but it was his sense that we are now free. We have overcome racism in America. And we all now have equal opportunity, equal access, and the proof is in Obama being elected as president. But James Cone never saw an end to the work of liberation in his presentation of black liberation theology. It was always this call for us to look at ourselves and for the white church to look at itself and its behaviors. And now that there is this look, can we finally have conversation that is honest? And part of the problem is we have trouble being honest with one another. So this work of liberation, this work to be free, is an ongoing, never-ending engagement. When will it end? When we get to glory. <laughs> because there's always something about what it means to be human and these stories that we are constantly navigating that keep us in a posture of self-defense always seeking to protect ourselves. That keep us negotiating with the pain and suffering that we've experienced. It's a part of our human narrative. And so when this question is asked about Han and is there a dialogical relationship between Han and soul and blues and can they inform one another well, yes, they can inform one another. They give us a, a common ground to begin having open dialogue with one another. And it also is highlighting the significance of seeing our humanity because the soul in African-American life and the blues of African-American life are an effort, a constant attempt to declare, I'm a human being. You know, we're, we're saying Black Lives Matter, but soul came about because everything that Africans experienced in America from the time we landed on these shores said we had no soul, that we were not human. And so the effort was always to declare, no, I got souls and I'm super bad. 
It was to declare everything as soulful as in a statement to say, no, I am a human being created in the image and likeness. And those blues, which are also related to the spirituals, were the expression of that deep divinity that's saying, I am alive. And I want you to hear the pain that is caused by these dynamics of living in this world of oppression, but I'm working my way through the pain to declare I am alive. I will not surrender to the death-dealing activities that are assaulting me each and every day. And so when you start asking these questions about suffering with Jesus, in the deeper history of African Americans of Africans in America, there was, yes, a suffering with Jesus, but more importantly, there was a statement that declared by looking at Jesus, Jesus knows all about our troubles. That because this one who is seen as divine is suffering in this world, this one understands my story. And more than that, there was this declaration because Jesus who suffered in this life became triumphant, I also can be triumphant and conquer this world. Where we, we, where sometimes folks look back on the narration of the experience of those Africans who were enslaved, we hear them as being otherworldly, as doing an escapist kind of theology. No, they were very present to this world and recognizing that once I get out of this world and I have the possibility of moving through this world because Jesus has moved through this world and I will rise like Jesus and will see life anew. Uh, and, and the final thing to say here uh, in that regard is, is to also recognize that in that early experience of Africans being socialized into the religions of America, Christianity, remember, was denied Africans initially because Christianity was seen as a religion of freedom, one of liberation. And that's the last thing enslavers wanted us to feel. So we were denied it until they figured out how to use it to say slaves obey your masters. But even hearing that, because we recognized that there was a divine spirit that had conversation with us, we said, oh, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> and they converted the Christianity they were given to themselves and made a new religion that declared we are going to be free. Thank you. Part of what I was attempting to communicate is that we're always going to be outside of a space and that it's necessary, it's important, it's vital that we do our best to enter into spaces that are identified as other. Mm -hmm. And what I was uh, attempting to share by way of the stories is to say it's important to enter in with this openness to say, you know, hospitality is more than what uh, the host gives. There's something to being hospitable in, in the reception of that. And that says that uh, you have to be open to listening and to be open to experiencing what is placed in front of you, what folks are seeking to offer you, and to receive it. And to not just say, oh, they're being so good to me because I deserve it. But you're really attempting to understand and be in relationship. So I was really building that around Thurman contact and fellowship. And, and then to say, you know, through that early story, 
there were things I didn't know and I assumed because my education told me certain things and I was wrong. Now, even saying that, that experience in the classroom, I didn't have to listen to my students. Remember, I'm the professor. <laughs> I didn't even have to observe that they were, you know, really annoyed with me. But the fact that I was working on trying to um, help to educate them, uh, it said I had to take a pause and ask, what's going on here? Because I want us to be in relationship in a way that we both can learn, we both can grow. And so all I can offer you is to say, be open and be willing to extend that hand and ready to receive what is given. Absolutely. And that's in part why I opened up this conversation the way I did. Let's think about our stereotypes. We've all been socialized, taught to look through a certain lens and to other someone in order to keep ourselves safe, which was the, uh, the starting point of saying we see someone head to toe, we have already made some assumptions about who they are based upon a checklist and now that I know who you are, I know how to deal with you. And it's all because of the stereotypes that I've placed upon you. So if we become aware that that is our starting point, you know what I teach folks in terms of a, a preaching um, process, you begin by taking your presuppositions, acknowledging them, now you put them on the side, and now you deal with the text based upon a new look at the text because you've already put those things that you have believed it says on the side. Can I just respond quickly, maybe? What it seems like, um, um, Dr. Butler, your, your work in the lecture tonight um, is like teasing us toward like a, a type of like cultural competency that is not reduced to cultural relativism. Right, um, that and, and because like, right, my grandmother, right, right is right, wrong is wrong. So like, there has to be like, the tools uh, to um, make certain universal judgments about like death dealing ways. I think this is you know your use of Thurman is is, is brilliant because uh, right he doesn't obscure the social ills, but. Um, but it still always tends toward a spiritual relationship that calls us to listen more deeply. Uh, and, and that's the profundity of, I think, what you're inviting us to uh, is, is, is actually to like engage deeply in the conversation, even when there's like risk for saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, but to like be engaged in a certain right conversation where it's like, yeah, Connie can, you know, help me re-narrate, right, the way that weaponization has happened. Uh, and like we're in this dialogue that's like pastoral and, 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 and not staying in the trauma, but trans like the talk of transcendence, right, is like actually what the, the theological resources at our disposal is the best of what is to be offered.
where we are in the contract in this space, so we're back to in the global world amidst the pandemic, amidst the war, um, amidst refugee crises. I know that there are labels who are weary and labored hearts. People are tired. People are, you know, communities of color have been engaging in this struggle and discussion for a very long time, and it's easy to find or to lose hope in that. And so I wonder, not a word of hope, but what would you say, and this would open to uh, you, Brother, as well as the panelists, what would you say to embolden the hearts of people engaged in this work to continue this work, mm -hmm. that not during this pandemic, it's, it's worth the price? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of my work, and I'm significant part of my work has been um, this work of theological anthropology and of seeking to uh, clearly articulate what it means to be human, what it means to be alive, and that has everything to do with being in relationship with others. And the world in which we live uh, seeks to dehumanize so many. And so it really is vitally important to me that we see the humanity of another because when we see the humanity of another, we are seeing God in another. And, and then that conversation becomes a holy conversation, becomes a holy relationship because it is the spirit that is speaking and it is our humanity that is grounded in the divine that is being articulated. And so the encouragement is to keep striving for life. Life is stronger than death and there is death all around us constantly. Keep striving for life and you reap the benefits of that in that struggle. Thanks for your amazing reflection and participation and also your time to be here. So thank you. And now we will finish and I hope that you have a safe journey back to your home, please. Thank you.